Hello. So this is called Royal Alchemist, as you can see. And um, yes, I'm. Uh, yes, I could be very angry at myself for just going straight into another talky talk one, and I am, because I could have played something that may not have had so much talking, but instead I went to this because I think it's gonna be longer. So yeah, well, that, that, we're just gonna do it. Um, the synopsis is. Intrigue, betrayal, deaths, and Otome slash BXB, boy boy, survival, raising simulation, which I don't understand. Survival raising simulation. I understand what a raising simulation is. I think that's a bit a weirdly worded, but um, yeah. Uh, anyway, in a high fantasy royal court setting with RPG elements. That's cool, if it's not all just, um, if it's not all just talking. I like that. Why is the achievements up here? Um, 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 um. <laughs> That's very interesting. Is that the, is our only choice to die? All right. Anyway, I guess we'll start. There's no resume. I don't have any data, so I don't know why that's available for me to click, but we'll start. Ah, yes. See, you can be a boy, but it, you will be romancing men. So that's why it's boy-boy. So obviously I'm gonna choose that as a girl, though. Oh, so you can... Okay, that's interesting. Lady. I want to be a lady, please. And, as always, of House Rosen... Cruise, cruise. Don't know. Anyways, let's go. All right, all right. Let's <gasps> let's strap in for some some talking. But let me actually pull open the thingy. All right. Two decades into his reign, the first king of Eskia was assassinated. Where's the music? Where? With the succession thrown open and none of the three royal princes ready to take the throne. The king's brother has assumed the regency. Hoping to guide the rightful heir to the throne, the regent has sought help from the High Council, a neutral and influential faction of powerful magicians. The delegate it has sent, however, isn't someone that Eskian aristocracy wishes, for more reasons than meets the eye. You are the High Council's delegate and newly appointed tutor to the royal princes. Ah, huh. so what, there are three... Three love interests? I actually don't know. Let me check. Okay, it features, yes, three dateable characters. That's what I figured. A male or female protagonist, yes. Mm, two, two stat raising systems. I don't understand that. Time management and quest system. Eight deaths and many deaths. Ooh. We're gonna die a lot. Okay. The journey ahead is riddled with obstacles, murky intrigues, and many dangers that may let your story end abruptly. Your choices will carry consequences as you make them. Take on solely burdens you can bear. Take on solely burdens you can bear. Maybe that's correct, but I feel like it's not. And choose your path wisely. Story mode easy or adventure mode normal. Do I want a hard time or an easy, like a good time? <laughs> I feel like that's always what it's asking, right? And the problem is, I don't know what I'm in for. Do you mind if I just go and quickly look at the uh, the discussions? Um, what? It depends on your reading speed and if you want to reach all ending. This is a how long is it question. Uh, I'd say tw 10 to 15 hours per route. There are three romance routes. The other five endings are friendship and generic. Do I want to do this? I will do this, but I, I don't know. Whoa. I'm not in this to have a hard time currently. <laughs> to a joyous venture and a happy end. My lady, 
Never mind. How much longer to Fosfrax, Captain? At this rate, my lady, less than an hour. I nod and glance absent-mindedly out of the carriage window at the scenery flying by. The night lies black and heavy over the murky forest that looms on either side of the road. No trace of the waning crescent moon can be seen through the storm clouds gathering in the sky. Distant rumblings of thunder mingles with the sound of the wind sowing through rustling leaves. An hour, he says. Will the weather hold up that long? Looks like a storm is about to break. Hard to say, my lady. We might just about make it in time. Perhaps we should have stayed overnight at that inn. Perhaps, my lady. The guard captain glances at me and casts a sheepish grin. Can't say we were sorry to leave the place behind, my men and I. We're all very keen to see home and hearth again. Ah, yearning for the embrace of the loving wife, Captain? And to see my daughters, my lady. My youngest turned three this month. She... I don't need to make that noise. The thunder did it for me. A sound akin to a stone splitting in two shatters the silence of the night. I bolt upright as the hair on the back of my neck tingles with apprehension. What was that? Halt, halt! The carriage jolts to a stop. Without a word, the captain rides on ahead to confer with the escort vanguard, leaving me to peer uneasily into the now ominous woods outside my window. Captain! Captain, I demand to know what's going on this instant! We're still trying to figure that out ourselves, my lady. The captain's face reappears by the window, a little pale and worried looking. I let out a breath I did not realise I was holding. None of the men saw anything out of the ordinary. I don't suppose you... No, maybe it was the thunder? You may be right, my lady. Neither he nor I sound very convinced. Should we have the coachman press the horses to hurry a little, Captain? The sooner we reach the capital, the safer. Better, I mean. My sentiments exactly, my lady. Turning his head, the captain rings out a series of orders. And with a jerk, the carriage starts moving again, this time at a briskish canter. I notice the guards are riding in a tighter ring around the carriage and that a few now have hands brushing the pommels of their sabres. And you, my lady? I beg your pardon? Are you looking forward to meeting your princely charges? Oh, I offer a non-committal grunt. How can I look forward to meeting people I know next to nothing about? Come now, my lady, you are going to be a royal tutor to three princes of Eskia. It's an exalted position, even for a descendant of the fav famous Rosen Cruz dynasty. Um, I can only assume it's said like that, so that's why I'm going to say it. Surely you must be curious. So I am, but I try my best not to let it show. It wouldn't do for the royal tutor to be to appear nosy or, heavens forbid, eager in front of a mere captain of cavalry. Cavalry. What am I saying? Hmm, Prince Seren sounds of the decent sort, by all accounts. A right gentleman is our Prince Seren. Every inch in a worthy successor to our late beloved king. Yes, but the slightest bit standoffish, perchance? One could say he acts out of touch with the people, but I won't do the honours. From what I've gathered, he doesn't appear to have the, uh, common touch that Prince Nazir does. Oh, no doubt about it. The commoners love the good Prince Nazir. A fine, dashing fellow who sweeps you right off your feet, if he has the mind to do so. If he has the mind to, but I hear he has many things occupying his mind these days. Unfortunately so, my lady. Seems to spend his days lounging around taverns, singing with troubadours and hiding from the, from moneylenders like a vagabond. He could spare it to be a bit more like his brothers, Prince Seren and Prince Aurelius. What is your opinion of him, Captain? For a moment or two, I watched the guard's cap captain's moustache bristle noiselessly. After some thought, he slowly replies, Well, my lady, one doesn't like to blow one's own trumpet, you know. But back in my younger years of fresh-faced cornessy, I don't know what that is, I was a deft chess player. Swept the field in the War Academy's chess competition. I was the reigning champion not just of my cohorts, but of my seniors and juniors too. And the Prince Aurelius? As a reward for my skill, I was invited to the palace for a game against the prince. I was told he was something of a chess enthusiast. Ah, I hope you were diplomatic enough to let him win. I didn't stand a ghost of a chance, my lady. What? I take a closer look at the man I am speaking with. But, Captain, that must have been nearly a decade ago. 
Prince Aurelius was nine, my lady, when I had the honour of a match against him. We travel on in silence for a while as I digest this new information. Curiosity gets the better of me and I pursue conversation with the captain about the princess once more. Prince Aurelius must have been quite a progeny growing up. So he was, my lady, and so he still is. It's a pity he hasn't any hope of ascending to the throne. What makes you say that, Captain? The nobility of the court have themselves set dead against him. Have they? Why is that? You mean you didn't know, my lady, the prince? The captain sounds like he is about to say something, but checks himself abruptly mid-sentence. The prince is much too clever for their tastes. You know how the nobles can be, my lady, swollen-headed, stuck-up parasites, a lot of them. The more competent someone is, the more they detest them. Ah, but not you, my lady. You're quite capable and considerate, befitting of your position, unlike most these days. I could not prevent my upper lip from twitching. It was a grossly sweeping generalisation, but at the same time, not entirely an unfair one. I did appreciate the admission of admiration, however, so I'll allow it. You're not of their estate, Captain? No, my lady. My parents are shopkeepers. I earned my commission by merit, not pa patronage. I smile and incline my head slightly. We, the alchemists of the High Council, share your views on the matter, and we wish more men of your stamp were in positions of authority throughout the realm. Many thanks, my lady. That's why I'm glad the Lord Regent chose one of you alchemists as the Prince's tutor. I do believe the kingdom and its moribund court are overdue for good, for good shaking up, you know. The guard captain's voice trails off. His muscle bristle, his moustache bristles again, and his brows furrow downward as he begins to frown. It's gotten strangely warm here. Huh? As we were talking, the temperature around us had grown imp imperceptibly but stead steadily warmer. Before long, I realize I am dabbing my handkerchief to my forehead, wishing I could permit myself the liberty of loosening a collar button or two. You're right. After we heard that, that sudden burst of thunder, it seems... That didn't sound like thunder. The guard captain's eyes widen. It's a trap. My lady, get out of the carriage, now! Gasp. He lunges forward and wrenches the door open. As the door swings outward, I see the carriage road beneath us starting to grow, glow blood red. Becoming rapidly hotter now, the air that blasts into the carriage might as well have come straight out of a furnace fire. The road is mined. This thought has just enough time to flash across my mind when the ground begins to rumble and shake. I squeeze my eyes shut and murmur the first spell that comes to my mind. As the last syllable of the spell leaves my lips, the petal markings around my neck burn to life, searing painfully against my skin. A violent force propels me upward into the air, right before a crimson inferno erupts out of the ground. I gasp, then scream as before my eyes the eruption devours the carriage, the coachman, the escort guards, the captain, the whole world in a horrific, blossoming flame. The terrible sight breaks my concentration, and the levitation spell I had cast, which had flung me away from the brunt of the explosion, dwindles and, fla and fails. My stomach twists with vertigo as I drop downward. A heartbeat later, I collapse onto the charred, blackened ground just outside the Ring of Destruction. Pushing myself up, I stare in shock at the carnage that had overtaken my carriage. Cruel red-orange tongues of flame lick the blackened outlines of the carriage, the horses, and the twisted charred rem remnants that had once been men. If not for the warning of the captain, in the split second... <sighs> I'm truly looking at the... at the audio and how it might be loud. If it's loud for me now... Alright, that's probably a bit better. If it's not, we'll see. Okay. Um, if not for the warning of the captain and the split second that allowed me to mutter a spell, I would have been one of them. Did we get her? Dunno, what she looked like. It had pretty much like a human-shaped charcoal now, same as the rest of this lot. Shadowy figures emerge from the forest and onto the road to stand by the flickering flames, pointing, gesticulating, chuckling. They are a bunch of burly, scarred men in ill-fitting scrap armour. Light from the fire gleams against their equipment. I see spears, hatchets, maces, knives, even a rusty, jagged sword. Suppose she's dead. Suppose we tell the boss she's dead, when it turns out she's only wounded and needed finishing off. Gah. 
She won't need finishing off. Not in this mess. Either the fire gets her or the smoke does. Someone pokes a corpse with the tip of his pike and turns it over. It is. It once was. It, wa it was once the guard captain. This her. She's all dolled up in a real fancy looking dress. Might be. A bit old looking though, ain't she? Let's see you look fresh and nice after getting exploded by five crates of... Logiston? That's how I pronounce it. <laughs> the mercenaries break into raucous rauc laughter that is grating to the ears. Quietly, I rise to my feet, not daring to breathe. At the moment, they are distracted and, from the looks of it, hadn't seen me previously levitate away from the explosion. I can take advantage of this and attack them. After all, they are merely hired goons, not master swordsmen or adept mages. I should be able to take down two or three in the initial assault using the element of surprise. That ought to be enough to scare off the, off the rest of them. On the other hand, I can take advantage of their distraction and run away. That may not be the most glamorous thing to do, but there is no reason for me to take any unnecessary risks when I don't know the situation. As the saying goes, the better part of valour is cowardice, discretion. The better part of valour is discretion. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this is a trial and error. There is no right answer here, and I already know there's no right answer here. Um, because, okay, so she said it herself. You attack them, you could, you could take out like three of them, max. Because uh, you got the element of surprise, and then, but then, are the rest of them really going to run away, or are they going to attack you? Retreat, you could run away, you could get away scot free, no one hears you, but they could also hear you. <laughs> so there's just no right answer. We have a grimoire. Okay, so we're going to attack them. Ooh, combat plus. I think of the guard captain and his wife and his shopkeeper parents and his daughters who will never see their father again. My decision is made. I whisper an incantation into the night and the night responds forthwith. There is a soft tinkling sound as water vapor in the air gathers around my hand, crystallizing into a saber of ice. Despite myself, a small cry escapes my lips as the pestle markings around my neck prick and sting. You hear that? You hear what? Now. Dunno, sounded like. Before the ruffian can finish the sentence, the tip of my saber is jutting towards him and into the space between his ribs. Kya! I wrench the blade out of the dying man and swing it hard against his companion's face. He does not manage to dodge in time and my saber cracks through his armor. Soundlessly, he falls. A glimpse of, a, I glimpse a blur of motion out the corner of my eye and pirouette a single hair's breadth away from the thrust of a pike. Before I can strike back at my assailant, the shining crescent of an axe blade is chopping towards me, and I barely manage to parry the blow. What the? I'd expected the mercenaries to flee from the shock of my attack, well, this is exactly what I said, but they are showing no sign of panic or intention to run. In fact, far from panicking, they seem unnaturally eager to see their dark business through to its ghastly end. The mercenaries surround me in an ever-tightening semicircle. Steadily and relentlessly, I am forced back towards the forest. Blow after blow rains down, merciless and inexorable. I can feel myself weakening under their constant pressure. Metal flashes towards me. I try to twist away but gasp in pain when something burningly cold slices into my shoulder. Icy numbness spreads across my hand and my saber falls from my nerveless fingers. Bad, bad, bad. I hold up my hands and murmur a spell. Shadows descend from the forest to enshroud me in a cloak of darkness. Exclamations and oaths burst out of the mercenary's lips when I sink into the night itself right before their very eyes. Where'd she go? She was right over there just a moment before, right over here. You think I didn't see that? Where the blazes is she now, is what I want to know. Meanwhile, I am scurrying deeper into the forest, careful not to make any noise. Look here. What? Blood. Ah, blood. So we stuck her one, eh? Not properly, but it's her blood, ain't it? Gar. We follow her blood and it leads us to her, see? When we find her, then we stick her one. And this time, there's no running. I curse under my breath and press, press my palm harder against my shoulder. But it's no use. I simply haven't the time or the means to stop the bleeding. Behind me, I hear the stamping of their boots growing louder with each step. They are trained and hardened fighters, well used to physical ex exertion. 
whereas I am an alchemist more accustomed to poring over manuscripts and casting spells than running. Or sword fighting, for that matter. Unless a miracle happens, and soon, this is going to be one unequal and very short hunt. Oof. I grunt as my knee bumps into the protruding edge of a crate and I stumble, nearly fall. Wait, a crate? You hear that? She definitely went this way. I walk over to the crate and swiftly pry open the lid. Even in the darkness, I can make out the smooth, dark red stones piled within. Blogiston. Fire Flogiston. The realisation dawns on me, and at the same moment, so does the plan. I don't know. Let's pretend to be hurt and die. Ooh, we got charisma. What's, what, what's the grimoire, huh? Ooh, magic affinity. Oh. Okay, so... Hmm. We have combat and charisma. Daily death. Daily life. I do, this seems very complicated. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah, I let out another cry at the top of my lungs for all to hear. Please don't hurt me. I'll do anything you want. Anything. As I expected, the mercenaries waste no time stampeding towards the sound of my voice. My, my, my. What have we got here? A little girl lost and alone in the woods. What happened to your leg, little girl? Please, I tripped and fractured my ankle. Gar. Have you now, you poor thing? An eyepatch-wearing ruffian takes a step towards me and licks the edge of his hatchet. One more step, you cretting. A little closer, no, a little more. Lucky for you, you've chosen a bad place to be lame in. <laughs> now! I raise my hands and cry out the spell's command. Sparks of fire spurt from my f my palms into the crate behind the mercenaries. Oi, she's... The fire flogiston in the crate shines bright scarlet. The mercenaries spin around. Eyepatch points an alarm to the shaken crate and opens his mouth. Too late. A boom. Another booming sound of thunder shakes the forest. The men standing closest to the crate are blown apart, reduced to nothing but smoke and ashes. Those further away leave behind remains that, in fact, are almost identical to the human-shaped charcoal they had mocked not ten minutes before. Eyepatch, who was standing nearest to me, which is to say furthest away from the floggish thon, I'm giving it an accent now, is rolling about on the grass in agony. I glance at the lower half of his body and immediately look away. With that one look, it's clear he will never walk again. Whether he is going to survive, however. Do you want to live? My patch looks up at me, refusing to speak. His one good eye is dark and unnervingly blank. I have to keep off the chills that tried to creep up my spine. I can cast a healing spell to... to mend your wounds, but only if you tell me who ordered you and your gang to kill me. Eyepatch does not reply, nor give, does he give any, any any indication of having heard my voice. He is not even rolling about on the grass now. Don't you understand? Unless you tell me the truth, you'll... Before I have the chance to complete my sentence, Eyepatch suddenly arcs his body and groans. His mouth opens and he sticks his tongue out at great length. His jaw smashes shut. He bit off his tongue. I stand up, shaken. The world spins. I fall back down onto the ground, trying to fight down my own repulsion that was eager to make itself seen. Resting my head on the cool grass, I gaze blindly up at the cold, hard stars. The proud high walls of Fostrax thrust into the azure sky as its battlement shines a blinding white in the splendour of the meridian sun. I am hurt, hungry, and tired to the bone, Yet I cannot help but feel a stir of awe as I take in the breathtaking sight. I nudge my palfrey onto the main thoroughfare, squeezing through the throng of townsfolk and livestock. At this very moment, I should be in the castle, soon to be confirmed by the Lord Regent as tutor to the princess before the estates of the realm. Instead, I look at my tattered, singed clothes and the ragged palfrey I had bought for an extor exorbitant price at an outlying farmstead this morning and woe at the misfortune. Because of the events that took place the night before, I decided to err on the side of caution and spend most of my time painstakingly covering my trail so not to be caught. At least, I've nearly reached the palace now. Soon I shall have a warm bath to wash myself in, hot food to eat, and a soft bed to sleep in. A thrill of delight shivers through me. Soon. 
You there, stop! An officious looking palace guard in ridiculously ornate armour is blocking the road. He glares at me and waggles his spear in front of my nose. What do you think you're doing, vagrant? I'm on my way to the palace. Oh ho ho, she's on her way to the palace. Squinting his eyes, he proceeds, he proceeds to shriek with laughter. The two other palace guards behind him let out a titter and one of them makes a rude gesture at me with his hand. The palace, street rat, only admits people of quality. Be so good as to scamper back into the sewer where you, from whence you came before I skewer you. Pardon me, you are making a terrible mistake here. I'm here to serve as the tutor to the princes by instruction of His Excellency the Lord Regent. And I am the High Queen of Caracossa, here to join the late King's harem. This witticism provoked another shrill outburst of merriment. I can already feel my patience rapidly wearing thin. My lips pursed on instinct. While trying to be civil, I couldn't help but glare at the guard. Despite never have having been awarded a, pa a patent of nobility and never having sought for one, my house is still recognised among the ranks of aristocracy. And as a representative of the council, I do not have to stand here and bear this idiocy. I had been ambushed by assassins. My carriage was destroyed. My escort was killed. I myself barely escaped the slaughter. So it's not the sewers you came from, but the asylum. Haha. <laughs> I am neither insane nor lying. No? No? Then I suppose I'd better let you pass, hadn't I? He moves to step aside, but stops mid-motion, as if remembering something. Oh, you said you're to be the prince's tutor, as I recall? You recall correctly. Then you will no doubt have the Lord Regent's letter of appointment hidden somewhere among the rags you're wearing. I... the letter of appointment? I feel my heart sinking. As ordered by the council, my appointment was to be kept hidden until my arrival due to security reasons. Alas, I totally forgot about the letter. I'm afraid I've lost it. Oh, oh, what an awful and utterly unexpected surprise. The letter was in the carriage, but... Get out of my sight before I gut you like a hog, imbecile. How dare you? I warn you not to take liberties. You warn me? You warn me? You know who I am, maggot. You know who my father is. I can whip you like a cur in the sweet, in the street, not the sweet. In the street, I can make you lick dirt from my boots. I can cut you to pieces and feed you to my hounds, and no one will so much as blink. So don't you dare warn me. You unspeakable lowlife. The tip of his spear taunts me as it wavers and glints. Suddenly, the guard freezes. His mouth snaps shut and he stiffens into a salute. Is something the matter, Hagen? That's a, that's a good looking lad. A young man makes his way up beside me with a small smile resting about his lips. The first thing that strikes me about him are his eyes, beautiful and almond shaped. They peer out into the world from under carefully hooded lids. Staring keen and guarded, those eyes take in everything and give nothing out in return. His dark cape rustles with every elegant move and the sound of something small and sonorous follows him. Eventually I noticed it coming from his golden earrings. A suspicious character is attempting to enter the palace and I was trying to chase her away. Suspicious character? Surely there must have been a misunderstanding. Pardon me, I don't believe I have the honour. I am Valky of House Rosencruz, coming to receive my appointment as royal tutor from His Excellency, the Lord Regent of Eskia. Even as I confidently say this, I feel my heart sinking. The young nobleman seems both friendly and influential, but there is no reason why he would be any more likely to believe these words from a haggard, disreputable-looking stranger like me than the, than the palace guard. Against all odds, the youth merely inclines his head slightly. It's a pleasure to meet you, my lady. Please, allow me to introduce my brothers. He half turns and makes a graceful motion with his hand for the first time I notice- and for the first time I notice the two youths standing behind him. This is Nazir. One of them looks up, running his fingers through his hair and behind his ear, and meets my eyes with a playful wink with his braid sliding over his cape ever so slightly. How do you do? And this is Aurelius. I take a glance at the nobleman's other companion. Beautiful dark hair gracefully falls to his hips, highlighting the fairest complexion I have ever laid eyes upon. Well, I guess he's not related to those two. Just a, just a theory that I have right now. 
In short, he is striking, but the, in the most ethereal and haunting sense of the word. Aurelius holds my gaze for half a second, then glances away, the impenetrable expression on his face unchanged. I am Serin, a prince of our fair Eskia, like my brothers before you, and very much at your service. He lowers his head in a courtly bow, not entirely devoid of irony, as realization finally dawns on me. I... you know what I'm gonna do, just so that I don't waste time? I'm gonna see if there's a guide. There's no guide. Makes sense. When... when was this released, exactly? Oh, it was... okay, it was only released on the 30th of April, but still. Quite a while without a guide, so we're just gonna wing it, we're just gonna have to wing it and like, save at pretty much every opportunity. Let's see what we get for getting to help dealing with the guards' charisma, okay. I say, you're not really Prince Theron, are you? He looks at me and I can see the surprise in his eyes. I assure you I am. Thank goodness. I lament in an overdramatic sigh, surprising myself with how much energy I still I seem to still have. Look, this blockhead here is refusing to let me enter the palace. Prince Seren tries to look pained, but I suspect he is trying even harder not to smile while Nazir deliberately lets out a chuckle. I have to use everything in my power not to get flustered by their reactions. I'm having the worst luck of my entire life thus far. I'm sure Hagen is only attempting to perform his duty. We really should be applauding his zeal in reforming himself so quickly after he was found in a brothel while on patrol. Nazir... By me. Nazir... Sorry, sir. Nazir smirks, looking not the least bit apologetic. Your Highness, you don't seriously believe the ramblings of this... this character. But I do. Can you not see these, Hagen? Prince Seren inclines his head ever so slightly in the direction of my neck. Understanding his intentions, I loosen my collar a bit, revealing the petal markings. The little eyes of the palace guard squint again, his lips working silently. These petal birthmarks are the birthright of every Rosen, Rosenkruz, and a symbol of their unique gift, their affinity for all six elements of magic. This lady is indeed the royal tutor, and our uncle, the regent, most anxiously desires to meet her. But, your highness, she hasn't got a letter of... I vouch for her. In his response, there resides the faintest hint of steel within his silky smooth voice. The palace guard blanches, even though Prince Seren's external demeanor, demeanor does not alter. Lowering his head, he obediently stands aside. Seren turns to me with a gentle smile. This way, my lady, if you will allow me. I smile back, and falling into a step alongside the prince, finally walk under the towering arced gates and into the great sprawling palace of Fostrox. Grimoire updated. Ooh. He does have very young hair. <laughs> uh, young hair? Long hair? Sorry, I'm- it is very fucking hot in my room. Prince Seren is the eldest child of the three princes and heir to the throne. He's known as a gentleman, even if a little distant. Okay. Prince Nazir is known as a natural charmer. If he puts his mind to it, he can sweep anyone off their feet, men and women alike. Prince Aurelius is known for his prodigal- Prod- Gal. <laughs> I hate that word, I hate that word. Okay, I know what it is though, it's prodigal. Something like that, okay, whatever. Abilities, and has been respected by some of the common folk since he was young. He isn't popular with the Eskian aristocrats. Right. Alright, well, I will see you in the next video, bye!